I'm going to ask every one of you to please rise up, because we're going to prepare ourselves for God's Word now. All right. So, when you go to a gym, before you do your exercises, what do you need to do? Stretch, right? All right. So, whatever you feel like stretching, whether it's your legs, whether it's your arms, whatever, you know, just give it a good uh, stretch, right? There we go. You know what my challenge in life is? It's to touch my toes. You know what? I am 40-something years old, and in all those years, I've never been able to touch my toes. My son, I mean, he puts his hands flat on the ground. It's embarrassing. But that is, that is me. Now, as you are stretching, how do you know that you're having a good stretch? How do you know? It's because you're stretching up to that point where it just hurts a little bit, right? That's when you know that you are, you're having a good stretch. Well, I want to encourage us today, as we go into God's Word, to stretch yourself just up to that point where it hurts a little. Then we know that God's Word is changing us. Some of you, I noticed, has not stand, stood up and hasn't been doing our exercise for the morning. And you listening to what I'm saying, and maybe you agree with it, but you agree with it only in theory. Why? Because you didn't feel the pain. Now, there's going to be a time when God is going to give us an opportunity to respond to God's Word. And I want to encourage you. You know, some things God can only do when we put it into action. So last thing I've got to say before we delve into God's Word is, when you go to a gym and you want to build some muscle, guys, you know what I'm talking about? What do we do? We load that bar with as much weight as we possibly can, maybe even a little more, right? And what is the thing that you need when, you're gonna, when you do that kind of exercise? What's the thing that you need with you? A spotter. You know what God is going to, God is going to lay something on some of your hearts this morning that is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. And you're going to be bench pressing something that you haven't bench pressed before. And I want to advise you the same thing that we know to do in a gym. Don't do it alone. Find somebody afterwards. Be vulnerable. Admit your weakness. And have that conversation. Because God wants to do something in our lives this morning. Amen? Are you guys ready for some exercise? All right, take your seats, take your seats. We're going to be reading, are we up there? Tech Gurus, are we up there? That's what we're going to be reading today, Acts 5, the second part of it. But to really understand the scripture, I need to give you a little bit of the backstory. So this is a story where Peter and John, they go to the temple, they heal a guy, they go into the temple and they say, it's in the name of Jesus. You remember that Jesus that you crucified just like about six weeks ago? That Jesus, it's in his name that this guy is walking around. Causes great chaos. The leader of the day, they arrest him. They put them in jail. They put them in jail. And then God breaks them out of jail. But of course, God has got style. And he breaks them in, out of jail in style. You see, what we read in the scripture is that in front of their jail cell, they posted two guards. Because you see, these guys know this is important. This is not just some fishermen from Galilee. These guys are trying to change the way that our society works. So they post two guards. They put shackles on them, put them in the most secure jail right there in the middle. And God breaks them out in the middle of the night in such a subtle way that these guys standing right outside, they don't even know it. So in the morning... They send word, go and fetch the guys from the jail. The guys turn around, open up the cell, and there's nobody inside. God has got style. Who knows that God has got style? So somebody else comes, tells them, well, you know, I know you tried to keep these guys in jail, but actually they are there in the temple. And they're busy preaching. You know what you arrested them for? Preaching in the name of Jesus? Well, they're kind of doing the same thing. So this is where we're picking up the story. All right, so can we get our scriptures up there? I'm going to just use my little portable jobby over here. All right, and let's go. From verse 26. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in 
and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. Boys, don't you have a memory? We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. But you are guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, sorry about the pronunciation, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men... Hey, sorry, my phone is doing funny things here. Where are we? Sorry, jump back. Is it up there? Let's just jump over. Where were we? Okay, Pharisee named Gamaliel, teacher of the law, honored by all, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a while. Then he addressed the men of Israel... Consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, this guy appeared claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in, had them flogged, and then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. That sounds familiar. And let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Funny what people rejoice in when Jesus starts changing your head, right? Rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Wow, these, these are different thinking people. They are not normal. Now I think... There's a, there's a safe way of reading this, and there's a dangerous way. Now, we warmed ourselves up. I think we are ready to do a little bit of exercise. I want us to put on our courage boots and bring this scripture from 2,000 years ago and bring it into today. Are you ready for it? So, what, is, what does this picture look like today? See, we, we also live in a day where there's, there's a religious establishment. It's socially acceptable, just like in that time. It's politically correct. And if we are really bold and honest with ourselves, we realize that that establishment today is called the church. What we call the church today, what we, I'm saying society, what men call the church today is people like us, who are sitting in a building. But I think if we are honest with ourselves, we, we all realize that when God looks at the church, He sees something very different. We see men in a building, and we say, okay, everybody in this building is the church. But God looks at things very differently. Also in that day, when God does something different in a religious establishment, then the religious establishment, what do, what's the name? What's the name that they use for that? When something doesn't fit into what is normally acceptable. The name we use is a cult. So, what would they have said? They would say that, you know what? There's some cult members in the temple today. And they are preaching. You know what? These guys, they never went to Bible school. 
They don't have any degrees. What do these people know? And you know what's worse? They're not even from Dar es Salaam or any big city. They're from the village. So we've got unschooled village people in the biggest church in town. And what they are saying is, all of you schooled people know nothing because our leader, our leader is the one. You know that the one that you've been saying, okay, maybe it's this one, maybe it's this one? No. Our leader, oh yes, and he's also from the village. Our village leader, he is the one. That's what it sounds like. And if, if it sounds ridiculous, it sounded ridiculous then too. Except for one thing. Six weeks ago, they killed that leader. And then they had to organize a cover-up because despite the arrangements of the, the religious leaders of the day, for once working together with the civil leaders of the day, they couldn't keep this dead carpenter in a cave. And they had to cover it up. That was embarrassing. That was hard to explain. But that's not all. Now, some of these guys that ha used to hang out with a cult leader, they're going to the temple. they also unschooled. They're also from the village. And this guy that couldn't walk for goodness knows how many years outside of our temple that we couldn't do anything about, he's walking. And he's going around our temple saying that that carpenter that you killed, it's by his name that I'm walking. That's embarrassing. But people are beginning to say, people are beginning to see that maybe the degrees don't matter that much. Maybe that's not all we need to take into account. Because if we have sick people, we just come, we just bring them here. Wait, Peter's coming. Just put him here, his shadow. Just, just let his shadow touch him. And we read, we read that when the shadow touched him, but he's unschooled, but the shadow touched him and he got healed. But they know nothing. But I'm walking. And people's experience started saying that God saw things very different to men. And that's what we're going to allow Scripture to take its spotlight this morning and say, what is the difference? We're going to shine. What is, what is the difference between living for what God is doing Versus living for what men think and what men can do. It's going to take courage. But I want to encourage us. This is, this is who we are. We are here in the name of Jesus, the one who died for us. There is grace in the room. And God wants to do something in our hearts if we've got the courage to be open with Him. So let's do that. They were in that situation. They had the guys back there with the leadership, and they had to ask themselves, what are we going to do? Because everything that we've always known does not seem to be working, but something here that, that looks entirely, totally wrong, God seems to be blessing. Well, the majority did, did what the majority of people still today will do. Say, we just do what we've always done, right? Judas is the one guy's name. Judas is the other one. We killed them. We got rid of them. We killed them. We got rid of them. All right, let's kill them and get rid of them. You know, that's what we do. Fortunately, there was a wise guy among them. And he says to them, boys, boys, we did this just a couple of weeks ago. And then we had one crazy cult leader from the village. Right now, We've got 500 witnesses that the crazy cult leader, he got up from the dead. Now we have 500 problems. If we kill these guys, are we going to have 1,000 or is it a multiplier effect? Maybe it's 25,000 crazies running around our city. Do you really want to do again what you just did? And reality sh shone its light through and said, listen. Even though you are totally against this, even all the years of culture says, don't do this. Come on, let's just stop and think about this for a while. And even they realized that they didn't want to do this. But they didn't take away the core problem. 
Here we had a bunch of people going around saying that God is doing something that does not fit into your religious mold. God is doing something that your religious establishment cannot do. What are you going to do about it? And that's the question that we've got to ask ourselves this morning. So what is it? What is it that, that turned Peter from a fisherman about his family business, something that we understand, something that we can relate to, something that's been happening for all the years, into this guy that the leaders of his day couldn't handle? Because that's why we're here this morning, isn't it? We believe that Christ can do something in normal lives, my life, your life, and turn it from a teacher, an engineer, a whatever, into a world changer. That's what we are here. So what is it? I want to take you back to Jesus talking about this topic. It's in Matthew, Matthew 23, starting to read from verse 4. I told you this is going to take courage, so... We can do this. We can do this. So, this is what Jesus said. Now, remember, this is where Peter got formed. That Peter that we read about in Acts, this is where he got formed. Jesus was saying to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law, that's the civil leaders of your day, and the Pharisees, which is the religious leaders of the day, sit in Moses' seat. That is authority. That's the authority that governs the way our society works. So, you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders. They say that these are tough times. You need to buckle up. You need to live frugally. You need to do whatever it takes. But I don't see them selling their houses and their fancy cars and changing the way that they live. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They wear suits in church on a Sunday. They live respectable lives. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love getting mentioned at the family functions, love having their name at the bottom of a paper and presenting at the conference. That's what it looks like in our day. There's a lot in there, but I'm going to jump forward quite a bit towards the end. It says that you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, cumin. You put your hand in the offering basket as it comes along at offering time. But you give in something that doesn't cost you much or sometimes you even put in nothing. You just want to be seen that, you know what, look, I, I'm doing my duty. I, we did that as children because we were more concerned about what the people around us were saying. Instead of having a conversation with God, God, what is it that you want to do in me by this basket passing along me? Give me something to give that costs me something, that changes me. Where only you and me know, God, what I'm putting in here. But then Jesus turns the spotlight and says, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice. Mercy. Mercy and faithfulness. You know, God calls us as a community to be specialists in this. When the world looks at us, at, at the group of people who say that we are followers of that name, of Jesus, do they say that, yes, if we want to know about justice, we're going to talk to these people. If we want to know about mercy and faithfulness, I'm going to employ one of these people. Or they just see people with suits gathering on a Sunday. Men, God. What is our goal? Why, why are we here today? Now, it'll be easy for us to say, ah, this is for them. 
This is those crazy people that actually wore stuff at the bottom of their clothes and, you know, did funny rituals. And, and say that this is not our story today. But let me ask you just a couple of questions. Just imagine for a second that I wasn't wearing such a beautiful outfit that made me look like Kwesi over there and, you know, sharp and organized. What if I was wearing my work clothes, my shorts, you know, standing up here? What if instead of a nice glass of water, I had a glass of wine with me up here on stage? Oh, of course. All right, let's go there. What if afterwards, instead of going for a little fritter and tea, I went outside and I lit up a cigarette? Would I be able to talk about justice, mercy, and faithfulness? I think especially the smoking one, that, that is the unforgivable sin, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it is. But I've got to confess that I've done all of those. But by the grace and mercy of the elders of God's tribe and God himself, here I am. <laughs> Listen, with the smoking thing, it was my brother and I. We stole one of my father's cigarettes and went and <laughs> tried it out. I nearly died, okay? So I haven't got back there at least. But what about Jesus? You know, I'm talking about these things as the cultural things that we associate with what does it mean to be a part of the church. But Jesus also had his run-ins with, with the culture of his day. How did he handle? You know, we, we are taught, don't offend. But how did Jesus handle this, this tension between men, living for men, and living, living for God? Let me take you back to, to Capernaum. Jesus is sitting there, and he's teaching and his family rocks up outside. It's very interesting to read it. It says that his mother and brothers, they rock up there. Now, if you read the Gospels, you will notice that you only read about Joseph when Jesus was a boy. Now, culturally speaking, they would have said Joseph and his family, except if Joseph wasn't around. Now, when a father dies... That authority passes over to the firstborn son. So for Jesus to be sitting in Capernaum, teaching, leaving his family, this is, this is scandalous. This is wrong. His father has got a business. His family has got a business. And he's supposed to be about his father's business. Right? So they rock up. They rock up outside and they said, what are you doing? You're the firstborn son. And he gives them the one answer that they want to hear and the last one that they want to hear. He said, I've got to be about my father's business. What is he doing? Is he saying that it is more important who I am in God's purpose for me then in this entire nation, in all of the history that it represents, everything that goes about him, it was a scandal. But he did it for our sake. So what does that look like? What does that look like here in our time, in our day? You know, for us, I think if you're talking about culture, the first thing that comes to mind is weddings and funerals, right? Right? How do we do a wedding and a funeral? That, that's close to the heart. That defines us. But we had a situation just a little while ago where a couple, they needed to get married. But to do it the cultural way, there were two options. Either you, you find loans and money to host all of these people that you're supposed to do and do all of the steps that you're supposed to do, and they would have walked away from it in such debt that either they would have had to default on the debt or it would have taken them years to pay it off. The other, the other side, of course, was, okay, we could just wait, wait, wait. Now, they already had a baby. They already knew that God wanted them together. And I'm so proud of them because you know what they decided to do? They said, 
I've got to be about my father's business. They sacrificed culture for obedience. And that's leadership, friends. That is leadership for this time that we live in. You know, let me, let me get even closer to the bone. In our city, we get taught, honor your elders. Right? Honor the authorities. And we do that. But we do that even to the point where criminal acts are committed. Where, where people are forced to do things that is so clearly against the heart and the essence of God's ways that we use a, a, a sideline in Scripture to justify what we are doing. We tithe our mint and dill, but we neglect justice and mercy and faithfulness. Who are we? Scripture is asking us this morning, who are we? But let, let me not leave the West. You know what? I'm talking about all African culture. Let me not be kind on Western culture. What, what, do, what does Western culture look like? I think, you know what? As Africa honors its elders, we honor the bottom line. Right? All you Europeans, I think the one thing that we don't compromise is we've got to build. You've got to build your career You've got to build your empire as a house. You've got to build your house. You've got to build. Whatever you do, make a profit. Build, build, build. And you know what? It may look different on the outside, but the heart, the heart of our cultures, as long as we're serving men, it, it very much says the same thing. It sounds something like this. Let my kingdom come. Let my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But of course, we're too spiritual to actually pray those words out, right? To us, it sounds something like, Lord, bless my business. Lord, keep my family from harm. Or if you want to get real spiritual, then we say, I rebuke the devourer that wants to steal my prophet. And then, as we have prayed for everything that's important to us, at the risk of not sounding spiritual, we end it all off in Jesus' name. Not taking into account that the reason why we honor the name of Jesus this morning is because He died and God rose Him from the dead. Which means, as those who worship Jesus, our breakthrough his glory lies in death and resurrection. And you know, without death, there can be no resurrection. But that takes courage. I told you today was going to take courage. Sorry if there's a bit of pain in the, in the stretching, but we did warm up for this, guys. We did warm up for this. I want to take us, just in closing now, I want to take us to one of the greatest examples for me in, in the Scriptures. We went from the disciples, we went back to Jesus, now we're going to take a big jump, all the way back to Joseph. Now, if we read about Joseph, if your, if your theology is about God blessing you and prospering you, I think Joseph must be one of your role models, right? Prime minister of Egypt, the biggest empire on the earth at that time, he leads the thing. He's been reunited with his family. So if family is your thing, they are right there. They are with him. And if prophet is your thing, I mean, Goshen. They've been given the best land in the biggest empire. They can get jobs in government. They can get free loans for agriculture. They are made. They are set up. I mean, this is, this is God saying this is the promised land, right? No. Because the story did not end there. In your own time, we're not going to do it now, but in your own time, go back. Go back to the end, the last two verses of Genesis. How does, how does God leave us? So he's done all of these things, but how does God leave us at the end of Genesis? It, it ends like this. Joseph, he's buried his dad. They are back there. They are set up. Everything is going great. And he says to his, to his brothers, to his family, to everybody, you know what? I'm about to die. But when I die, 
You're going to take my bones back to the promised land. Think about who's saying this. This is Joseph, prime minister. I mean, he can get the biggest pyramid. He can set up a future for his family. He is the man. And what is he saying? What is he saying by saying, by saying, take my bones back? He's saying that, you know what? As great as all of this is, I am on top of the world. It's not enough. It's not enough. God has given a promise to me, to me, my family. God has given a role for us to play in history. And I want to be a part of that. So you don't bury my bones here in Egypt. You're going to carry my bones with you. And you know what, what really makes this great for me? Is Jacob. He's already, he's already prophesied. And he's singled out Judah. If they go back to the promised land, Judah is going to be the main guy. He is going to be the one. So what is Joseph saying here? He's saying that it's better for me to be an unknown part of what God is doing than to be the king of something among men. It's better for me to have an unnamed little part in what God is doing for all of eternity than to be the king of the biggest empire on earth. This is not enough for me. It's not enough. I want in. I want in with God. And for 400 years, those bones were lying there. Those bones were speaking. To the Egyptians, for 400 years, those bones were saying, you're not good enough. Sorry. For 400 years, the Egyptians must have looked at these guys and said, so, you think you guys are special, huh? For 400 years, you can imagine why things turned over time, right? Oh, you're God's chosen people. So where does that leave us? 400 years. But for those same 400 years, those same bones were speaking, saying to them, there's a promise. Whatever happens, I know you're coming from the top. You may be at the bottom, but there's a promise. 400 years. When they were slaves, when they got whipped, there's a promise. There's a promise. And Egypt will never be enough. 400 years. I want those bones to speak to us this morning. I want us to spend some time now and listen. Listen to what the Holy Spirit, how would the Holy Spirit apply this word in your life? I told you, it was going to take courage. And I want us to open up our lives before God. Now, I'm going to invite everybody to close their eyes. And let's be vulnerable before God. We've looked at what this word has done in the disciples' lives, in Joseph's life, in many other people. But what does God want to do in your life this morning? The question that, that Joseph and Jesus is asking us, this morning, what, what is your, your earthly kingdom? What ties you down here to earth? What is your Egypt? What is your, your treasure here on earth that men will see, men will honor? But it will stop you. It will take some of your time, some of your resources, but most importantly, some of your heart. And it will own it. What is... What is your treasure here on earth? Maybe it's that house that you are building, that you've invested so much in for so many years. What, what, what is your non-negotiable? The one thing that surely, surely God will not ask this of me. Maybe you've inherited some land and it's your duty to your family to, to look after it. Maybe it's your identity. 
as a citizen of Tanzania or the States or South Africa or whatever country, you identify yourself with, this is who I am. Maybe it's your body. And we're talking about death. Sheshi, you're talking about sickness. Maybe it's your body. What is, what is that one thing that in your conversation with God, in your obedience, that thing cannot go onto the altar? I want us to give us an opportunity this morning to declare Jesus as Lord over that thing. If the Holy Spirit is, is highlighting one area in your life, I want to give you a victory in that area this morning. And we're in the fortunate position that we're a group of people here together. And that gives us the unique opportunity to choose what God is doing over what men may think. Because I'm going to invite you to come up here, here to the front, as an act. I mean, you know, you know what it is. We, I'm not going to, we're not going to share testimonies or something, but people may see you walking up here. So walking up here is a declaration that, yes, you've got something in your life that you are dealing with. It's going to take vulnerability. It's going to take admitting that you're not everything sorted out, that God is working in you. But God will also be watching. So if God has highlighted an area, I want to invite you now with everybody's eyes closed. I want to invite you to come up here and to kneel down and put it. Put it before God. And in your action, I told you that there's going to be action. In your action, I want you to declare God as Lord over that area. Let's, let's just give each other some time. The floor is open. If you want to come and do that, come kneel down here. Come give. Come give a new part of your life to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you are doing among us this morning, God. Thank you for new areas in our lives that worship you. Thank you for new areas in our lives, God, that honor you, that bring you glory, that declare that you are more able than us to live our lives, that your wisdom is greater than our wisdom, your power is greater than our power, God. We want to worship you. We want to worship you. We want to honor you. And we want no area in our lives to be held back from the glory of honoring your name. God, you know our hearts. You know our lives. God, we don't want to just worship you on a Sunday. God, we want to see your name great on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday. God, let everything in our lives, everything that has breath, everything that says something in our lives, let it declare your Lordship, God. God, as, as we are gathered here before you, God, we declare that in this community, among these people, there is one name. There is one name that means life. More than death itself, it means life. And that's your name, Lord Jesus. It's your name. And Lord, we declare that you are Lord over every, every area of our lives. Over our possessions. Over our reputations. Over our safety. Lord God, over our families. God, every area that is so precious to our hearts, God, you are more precious. You are more powerful, more faithful than anything, anything in our lives. So God, we cast our lives, 
onto your faithfulness, onto your ability to provide, your ability to protect. God, as we, as we kneel here before you, God, we declare that you are Lord. God, whatever your purpose asks of us, God, we trust that you are good. Your ways are good. And we pray, Lord, have your way. Teach us afterwards, God. Lead us. Give us understanding. But right now, God, we're, obe we're obeying. We're simply obeying God. You are Lord. Lord, I pray that as we are gathered here, God, that you will lead us to next steps. God, that you will give us the courage to discuss these things with people that you have anointed with wisdom. Lead us to who to discuss it with. Lead us in those conversations, God. Lead us in the way that we should go. But right now we declare, God, all of us, all of us, we are yours. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Guys, I want to say well done. Well done for your vulnerability. We can go back to our seats. Um, and to the whole community, I want to say let's be there. Let's be there for one another. It's not an easy journey. It's not. But God is faithful and His grace is there. So let's reflect that as we, as we process this word together. Let, let's reflect that as we are there for each other. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, guys. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Etienne, my brother. May God continue to use you. May God continue to bless you so that more souls can go to Jesus because of you. Thank you. So this marks the end of our service. I believe you have all been blessed I wish you a wonderful, wonderful Sunday and a wonderful week ahead.